talk about a gift from my parents and then I get emotional just thinking about it. How do I thank them? How do I say, hey, what you did was amazing and I appreciate it kind of thing. Um, so yeah, that's an enlightened moment I would say. Welcome to Waking Up with Rabbi Josh, a podcast built around conversations with people in our community who have found enlightenment in their lives. While these events may not seem life-changing, the conversation will reveal how these moments shape the way my guests see the world. This informal conversation and insights from Jewish tradition may change your life as well. And if not, it's just 18 minutes with me. So l'chaim. To life. Today we welcome Danny Hertz, the director of the Six Points Sports Academy, formerly of Greensboro, North Carolina, now in Asheville, North Carolina. And uh, I've had the opportunity to work with Danny and to be a part of his life for these last few years. And I'm really excited to welcome you to the show. Rabbi Josh, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity, but any time spent with you actually is wonderful for me. I always like to listen to you, learn from you, and certainly just have a conversation with you and often leave these conversations, formal, informal, or just in passing, enlightened um, along the way. So thanks for the opportunity. I do really appreciate it. Great. So let's get down to business. Uh, I've had the opportunity to get to know you in the context of camp. I've seen you as a coach, as a leader of a summer camp community. But I also know that you did not start your life here in the United States of America. You were born in South Africa and the transition from one community to the next has really left an important mark on your life, on your soul. Can you share with us the story? Sure. Uh, I moved when I was 12 years old. And at the time, before internet, before the ability to really know what I was getting into, as a 12 year old boy, I moved to Boca Raton, Florida, and I moved in January. So picture a kid who comes, who has a very thick South African accent, had never really heard an American accent other than on TV. Um, and I show up, I have clothes that look different, um, certainly a hairstyle that looks different, and yet I'm trying to fit in uh, in, in seventh grade, where it's really, really difficult, as you know, to begin with, without trying to see uh, how everything happens. And I will tell you, um, my first six months, that, that first January to June time, uh, I used to go home and, and practically cry every night. It was difficult for me to move to America. And I think that that's okay. I can only imagine what it was like for my parents. I, you know, looking back on it, they were really young when they went through it. Um, and I think the lessons that I learned then, and especially now in hindsight, uh, really have been life-changing, uh, you know, for me to figure out how to, to get along with people that were different at the time, but really weren't different. You know, I think that's a, that's a great step. The reason we moved from South Africa now, especially in, in the world today, is, is more important than ever. My parents wanted me to be in a, a situation where everybody was equal. And, you know, apartheid was legal in South Africa at the time. And I remember from the time I can, I can remember, literally, this is not where we want to be because not everyone is treated with respect and fairness and equality. And so the, the reason we moved and uh, my parents to, to, for whatever, they had a great life there. So they sacrificed everything why? For my sister, for me to have the opportunity to come to a place where we're treated equally, have an opportunity to do what we want to do, to have an opportunity to be proud of who we are. Um, and, you know, I always, I, one of the reasons I respect you so much is the importance of family. And family for us was important too. And yet the larger family essentially stayed in South Africa so that the immediate family can have this life. And uh, you talk about a gift from my parents and I get emotional just thinking about it. How do I thank them? How do I say, hey, what you did was amazing and I appreciate it kind of thing. Um, so yeah, that's an enlightened moment, I would say. 
I, yeah, for sure. I, so I, I, you talked about equality. You talked about coming to this country to get something that you couldn't access there. I want to come back to that in a minute because you also mentioned that you came and you looked and you spoke differently from kids here. And yet here in this interview, you sound like an American. You don't speak with a South African accent. How did that happen? Why did that happen? And, and is that part of the the enlightenment that you, you sort of the waking up that happened to you that made a difference? Great question. I don't know. Um, I think that the accent changing happened naturally, although I can tell you in an effort to have people listen to what I was saying versus how I was saying it, I probably sped up that process. Um, I can tell you, I can switch right now and talk to you in a South African accent without thinking. I can do either of those very naturally and very easily. Um, I've been begging almost, you to do that for years, and that's the first know, time you've ever shared that with me. It's, a, it's not even like a translation in my head. It's just something that comes naturally. And I'm not great with languages. I'm not great with anything like that. But the accent is easy um, because it is also natural. So, like, for example, I still have Shabbat dinners with my parents, virtually or other ways. How do we do that? We still have the, the South African accent is still there. And I think so when you... I, I think that's really interesting because when you need to access one cultural identity, you can use it and do it. And if I'm hearing you correctly, needing to be an American as a teenager to fit in, that mattered. And so you, you made a choice to, to use that moment of enlightenment to be the best person that you could be. Yes. Although you look back as an adult and you said, did you really need it at that time? Meaning, I think that sometimes young people uh, tend to put something on the top of the priority list that really may not end up being on that top of that priority list later on in life. And I think now, just as you said, you've been asking for the accent. At the time, I was trying to get rid of the accent so people they weren't imitating me to make fun of me. They weren't uh, uh, replicating the way I spoke because they were teasing me in a way that was less than kind or, or even gracious. But I took it that way, perhaps being defensive. So maybe it was on me at the time also. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's a good lesson too. And, and as a child, you don't see that. Um, several things. <laughs> that you go through as a kid when you look back, you're like, all right, maybe, maybe it wasn't as I thought it was. Um, you know, I know that that's, that's been a lesson that's helped me with a lot of things in life as, as you get older, but certainly the accent one uh, was um, a big deal and certainly bigger at the time than it is today. And you have spent an entire career as a teacher, as a coach, as a director of a camping community, I think that you have learned lessons along the way about people and intention and how we treat ourselves and others that really aligns obviously not only with my work as a rabbi and Jewish tradition, but with who you are as an individual. And yes, maybe that came from the lessons you, you gleaned from your parents but you've applied it in every place in your world. So my question for you is, is there a consistent life lesson that has crossed all of those platforms that you sort of have as your mantra? That, that if, if I could say, what is the Danny Hertz motto? What is it? <laughs> uh, that's another one. I, I, I think the idea that everyone First of all, the idea that everyone has stuff that they're going through has gone with me throughout all those years and, and as they've gone by. We don't know what's happening inside people's homes or even inside their mind or inside their day-to-day -day kind of thing. Uh, as a coach and as an educator, it's one of the reasons I've enjoyed certain parts. It's one of the reasons I love camp is that we can accept people for who they are. We see them, we, we value them for what they are. and and. You know, sometimes, again, going back to kids, they think that whatever's going on makes them less than perfect, where both in, in Judaism and in, in education, no, that's why we love them. Like, we're all 
in okay and and in god's eyes in our eyes and everybody's eyes we we see you we 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 value you for who you are um and then my dad early on was very tough with me um never would put up with any sort of complaining especially in a comparative way uh, never not just in terms of other person might have a, a different tennis racket or uh, in terms of vacation, never would they ever put up with anything like that from me, which I really value because I think materialism or materialistic view of certain things is, is not the way to go. But it's the idea that, look, some people have it better than you. Some people have it worse in certain areas. And then you can bring something to the table in different areas that others perhaps can learn from you, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Again, it goes back to valuing every person. Um, so I, I like that. And I think the other thing that I hope to take with me from my parents is having high standards is okay. That demanding a lot from people without being demeaning, in fact, it's the opposite, demanding with love, which is tough to do. Uh, I think I get that from my parents too. And, and when people say, okay, you know, you demand a lot or you have high standards, I take that as a great compliment where some people can look at that exact statement and say, well, maybe he's a tough, leader, boss, coach, whatever it is. I think high standards are okay. Um, and in fact, I think, you know, we, we ask a lot, demand a lot from people we love and care about and want to see the best come out of. And all those play into, as you mentioned, my background as an educator, certainly as a coach. And I, I, I get satisfaction, even though I don't do it for myself, but I certainly get satisfaction when others are able to shine and succeed and um you know get their moment of of glory if you will uh, and it might be small right it might be it doesn't have to be on a grand stage um it doesn't have to be a big event um, and contrary to perhaps what what is going on in the world today it doesn't have to be on facebook instagram twitter it, it just means a lot to the person and it's one of the reasons i really love uh working with young people um, and having an opportunity to make an impact um, it's amazing to hear you say this because what you're really talking about is that you've taken that immigrant experience that you came to this country with. Uh, I, I want to make a different life for myself. That was your parents' goal. And you have turned that into not anxiety, right? A lot of people in this world are experiencing anxiety because of that high expectation. You're saying expectation with love equals becoming the best human being we can be. And, and I'm hearing you talk today and it's immediately connecting to me to the, the biblical verse, the love your neighbor as yourself, have high expectations of yourself and you can then have high expectations of somebody around you. So can you give me an example where you have seen that demand for high expectations of a player, of a, a staff member has has worked where you've seen, maybe without a name, but is, is there a moment where you've watched that loving demand work in the world? I think sometimes there, those moments occur where people think certain things aren't possible, maybe in a bigger level. Um, certainly when you're um, involved with an organization or a group or even on a team level, um, and then more importantly, I think when you see a, a young person do something that she or he probably didn't think they could do. Uh, I have, and I save it in, and I could, you know, believe it or not, pull it up, I'm sure on my computer. Uh, there's a great video. It's no more than seven seconds long that was taken and I didn't know it was being filmed at practice one morning. And we used to go at six in the morning before practice, uh, before school. And I remember the kids saying, you know, um, it's kind of early, da, da, da. And, and we said, okay. Um, and I, there was a kid whose goal was to dunk the basketball. Simple goal, but, you know, in, in our mind and, and whatnot. And it actually was, was a, a, a Jewish young man who I'm still close with today. This was probably 10 years ago plus. But I said, I said, I'll tell you what, if he dunks it right now, and he's been trying for two years, but if he dunks it right now, no practice tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. We'll go at 3 p.m. Well, during a water break, they're allowed to, to try that once a, once a practice. So the kid did it and he dunked it. 
And I, I tell you, and I didn't know there was video or anything like that, but he took it, he, he dunked it, he takes the ball, he slams it down in, in excitement, but the entire team jumped on his back, celebrated, it was loud, it was noisy. And what did that represent? It represented the kid feeling really good, the team celebrating for him, which I really like when people do that. Like That's one of my favorite things when I can get happy when you do something cool. Right. Um, and then it was a moment for me just to see the child reach the goal and then to see the kids all bought into the kid feeling good. Um, so yeah, it was one of those, I, I remember that moment and I watched that video with, with great pride. And uh, believe happened. it or not, something stupid like that. It happened because you had set up the idea that we set high goals for ourselves and we try to achieve them. And that's something that sometimes I worry doesn't exist anymore in the world. I, I, I want to take a minute and, and refocus to where you you immediately went to with your journey from South Africa to America and this idea of equality. When you see what's happening today in the area of racial injustice and inequalities, are you bothered now that you've you've spent a lifetime in America and now you're experiencing exactly what your parents attempted to pull you away from? I think in some ways I'm bothered that while I thought I was educated or I thought that I was someone who didn't see color, I, I have a lot to learn. And I think that's been eye-opening where getting away from what we, th just getting away from apartheid led me here, but yet I've still got so much to learn. And in some ways I, I say to myself, did you, did you miss stuff along the way? Were you, uh, was I complicit in making an environment that wasn't great? Like that. So I oftentimes, even though I, I am so thankful to be here and I still am, I wonder if I could have done more to make an environment that perhaps led to literally equality because we don't have that. And, and, while I thought I was doing my part and I, I still have so much to learn and, and that's okay. I mean, I think our life is a journey. It's not finished. I'm never done learning. Um, and, and going through this probably has opened my eyes. I know it has um, to see, all right, what could I have done better and what can I do better? Um, and how do I, how do I do that? So in many ways, that's, that's been um, eye opening. Um, and that's the high expectation that your parents gave you in that incredible gift of making the decision to bring you to this country. And here you are still looking to attain bigger things. I, I too feel that we have so much to learn, uh, so much to understand so that we can be better citizens, better community members. And as you said, honor every human being as equal and a gift in this world. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really an amazing opportunity to hear you talk, to take this little moment of transition in your life and to see how powerful and impactful it has been. We're getting near the end of our podcast, so I wanna just take a moment to ask you a question that I'm asking every guest uh, before we leave. And that is, is there something that you're reading right now, something that you're watching right now that is really making a difference? Can you give us a book recommendation or a movie recommendation or even a bingeable television show that you're watching that uh, has made a difference in your life? Um, I'll tell you what I've gotten into uh, recently is seeing how there has been either a cover up or a look away in what happened at Michigan State and USA Gymnastics and mm -hmm. how we didn't see it or didn't want to see it or covered up, uh, that to me is the lowest of, I mean, of many, of many crimes, but a, a terribly, um, it's, a, it's, it's criminal, literally, figuratively, in every sense of the word, where were the people who were supposed to be there to advocate for, look out for, act on behalf of young people, of athletes, of students, um, and so there's a great show on Netflix about it. It's, it's the letter A, um, and it is, it is worth watching. Um, and it's got the connection to what I believe in, in terms of uh, young people, in terms of athletics, in terms of uh, making sure we 
can be good to, to human beings. And we weren't in that case. And we, we have a lot to learn. And I know that, that there's certainly many things going on with regards to trying to make it right, but I don't know if you ever can. Um, and it's worth watching. So that's something recently that I did uh, certainly see on Netflix. Amazing. As you know, that uh, I have a son going to Michigan State next year, so that uh, that issue is a sensitive one here. Obviously, as a father of a, an ex-competitive gymnast, that too is a really powerful reality. And I think that what you've done today has helped us all see that we can have these high standards for ourselves, apply them in the world, and make our world a better place. And that's really what this podcast is all about. So I am so happy to have welcomed Danny Hertz, the director of the Six Point Sports Academy in Asheville, North Carolina, to the show today. Danny, thank you so much for being with How us. How about Josh? Thank you. You're a mensch, a leader, uh, certainly a role model for me. Um, and thank you for the opportunity. But I will say also, and I think you and I share this, uh, I may be speaking out of turn if I'm going too long, but I think that moment of enlightenment that we speak about, there are others also that I think yield to change. And I, I think we all are capable of, of finding them. Uh, so I'm, I'm impressed with how you're going about this and thankful for the opportunity to, to share. So thank you, Rabbi Josh. Phenomenal. Thank you everybody for joining us and looking forward to seeing you at future episodes of Waking Up to Life, 18 minutes with Rabbi Josh. Until then, L'chaim.